Thank you, Paul. That was beautiful. Thank you, thank you. I think I need, to, I think it's me. Nope, nope. If you can uh, set me up there. Test the, oh, there you go. Okay, sorry about waking you guys up. Waking you, turn, turn me down just a little bit. Amen. Well, listen, I want to welcome all of you this morning uh, to church. I pray that God blesses you today in a very special way. I pray that, that you connect with the Lord this morning. Uh, he is here, ready to connect with you. We just need to be open. A couple of quick announcements. Uh, Kids Central is having their, their Christmas marketplace at noon. Uh, if those of you can come back, uh, we, we can uh, be part of that. That'll be over in the flesh of Paul. We are taking poinsettia orders. I want to thank the Kepner family who donated all the poinsettias. Uh, you'll see them around. Now, we keep them in the corner until after the holiday concert. Uh, then we'll put them up on the stage and you'll see them. But I want to thank the Kepners. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, yes, 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 thank you. Um, holiday concert is next Sunday. Uh, I know the choir has been working really hard. I know Tom and the orchestra have been working real hard. It's a great way to invite a friend. I hope each of you has another one of these. Uh, it's all the activities that we're doing. This is great for some for you to give to somebody. Uh, so this is uh, all the activities that we have coming uh, in the next couple of weeks. I mentioned last time that Christmas is a wonderful time to invite, uh, especially non-church goers, to church. Because we live in a time and live in a world where everybody's searching for truth. Everybody's looking for what's, what's life really about. And in that search for truth, this is a great time to invite somebody to a church activity. They would more likely come during December than any time of year. So I want to encourage you to be, to be inviting. In January, we're going to start an alpha class, a new alpha class, which is about answering your questions about your faith. And it's really geared for people who don't believe in God. And we just had our first alpha group. It was a wonderful, wonderful group of 25 people. We're going to do it again starting January 11th. I'll talk more about that in the future, but just letting you know. Now, you can help me for the holiday concert. We are going to have a little reception in the back with coffee and tea. And we would like to have some cookies and some, a couple pastries. If you can donate cookies to the church, we're looking for cookie donations. We need them before next Sunday. So if you can bring them, you can actually bring them next Sunday, actually, because the concert's at 6. So we're looking for cookie donations. Uh, we're also taking uh, Christmas gifts for the children. Our, our United Women of Faith have a booth in the back. And, and uh, so we're getting ready. We're preparing. You know, it's busy time. Uh, you've already gone to probably a few parties, get-togethers, preparing for the birth of Christ, for the celebration. Let us sing one of the beautiful uh, Christmas hymns. What child is this? It's uh, hymn number 219. But it is on the screen. Please uh, stand and sing with our choir. What child is this? Oh 
us uh, remain standing as we recite together the traditional Apostles' Creed. This is the uh, creed that has been ex in existence for many, many years uh, as a reminder of some of the basic foundations of our faith. And by the way, we share these beliefs with the majority of the Christian churches around the world. So it's always good to uh, recite and remember um, some of our basic foundations. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From then he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen and amen. Uh, before you sit, please turn around and greet each other this morning with a holy hug and a heavenly handshake, welcoming each other in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This is, a, this is a time of our offering. And again, we, we have baskets in the front and the back. There's also several ways you can give online. And we thank you for your gifts. Um, this morning, uh, our offertory hymn is, again, another beautiful hymn this time of year, O Little Town of Bethlehem. I pray you sing along with our choir.
And as, our, as it is our tradition to light the Advent candle, today lighting the candle is Kirsten and Phil Hermanance. Uh, Kirsten has been a blessing to our church. She, ser she serves as our uh, uh, church administrator, and uh, she's the one that keeps me in line. So please, please, she, she, uh, we're very blessed by Kirsten. And then Phil, without knowing, uh, became a volunteer in our church. And so he, I keep joking, he becomes employee of the month. He's been doing so much fixing and helping us around. So we're very blessed by the Herman Nance family who are, yes. Who are lighting the candle of peace. And I do have a question for you all. Um, what gives you peace? Peace to me is when you're comfortable with yourself, comfortable with those around you. Amen. And peace to me is when you can set fear, worry, and conflict aside and let happiness into your life. On this second Sunday of Advent, as we think about the coming of Jesus Christ, we light the candle of peace. Jesus Christ is our peace. He is the Prince of Peace and the fruit of his presence is peace. I have to take that from you. Christ comes to justice, wholeness, and harmony to every relationship throughout all creation. He wants to continually grant us peace in every situation. Peace is not lack of conflict. Following Jesus will sometimes result in conflict with the world. The kind of peace Jesus offers is the opposite of fear. Jesus, we pray, guard our feet into the path of peace. Help us to spread peace this season. Peace at home, peace in our country, peace in the world. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much for lighting the candle of peace. Uh, now let us turn to prayer, lifting up our concerns as well as our joys. I want to, uh, you know, we're constantly praying for uh, the trouble in Jerusalem, the trouble in Gaza. I pray for peace. Pray no more war. That the hostages be brought home soon. That no more children or uh, people, uh, no more bombing, no more killing. True peace. Uh, we just ask God to intervene. Uh, so we lift up that area. Also want to mention on a sad note, uh, and I mentioned a couple weeks ago that Japu, who is a member of our church, uh, um, I, don't, I, can't, I, I don't even know her first name. She's always been known as Japu or Mamzi, uh, passed away uh, uh, last week. And her family is actually having a service uh, on Friday, December 22nd here at the church at 11 a.m., uh, you'll, you'll hear more about it in the coming weeks, but we lift up the family. I uh, want also uh, lift up as Ben um, Gilbert, uh, 50 years uh, anniversary. Did I get the right brother, by the way? All right. Gabe. See, I knew I'd get the wrong one. I knew I'd get the wrong one. You, both brothers, uh, but Gabe celebrates 50 years with his spouse, and so we lift him up. And I'm glad your brother's here to support you. Amen. 50 years. He celebrates today. So let's give uh, him a, a round of applause. Because uh, it is a joy. Wow, 50 years. That's amazing. Let us uh, turn to the Lord. <clears throat> Father God, we uh, come to you again this morning. We celebrate as well as our hearts break. We celebrate uh, Gabriel's 50 years. We just thank you, Lord, for his love with him and his wife. We lift him up right now. Lord, we pro also pray for Japu and her family. Pray, Father, to give them peace. Pray for her, and, and she was a good and faithful servant who loved you, Lord. Loved this church, loved you, and so we know where she is today. And that gives us hope that, that we will see her again. Father, we again pray for peace. Peace around the world, specifically in Jerusalem. During this uh, time that we celebrate the birth of your son, we ask for peace. Lord, what a, what a great... Uh, just what a great time to celebrate. I lift up all the families, all the events, everything that's going on in our lives and in the life of our church. I pray for our, our children's ministry uh, later today. 
as we have the marketplace that we bring children into our community and share Christ. I pray for the concert next week, Lord, the holiday concert, that people can feel the joy and the love that we as a community can come together. We need so desperately to come together, Father. And then we pray for our three Christmas Eve services. We pray, Lord, that, that you light something special in the lives of all that are going to be here that day, especially those that do not know how much you love them. And, Father, together we pray this morning the prayer that your Son taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. This is uh, the second Sunday of Advent. I want to welcome those of you that are watching us from home, uh, whether it is because you live out of town, please let us know you're watching. Let us know where you're watching from. Even if you're watching later in tonight or on Monday or Tuesday, you can send us a message and, and just let us know. We have friends from Japan. We have friends from Panama. We have friends from all over the country that watches. Some have never even stepped room in our sanctuary. So we're very blessed uh, to, to be a church uh, that's uh, loved and, uh, and we welcome those of you. So again, Second Sunday of Advent, most of my message comes from a book by Bishop Will Willimon called Heaven and Earth. And it's a series on Advent. Last week, we, we talked about uh, in the meantime. And I shared with you that in the meantime, that we wait in the meantime, uh, as we wait between a Advents, uh, well, what, what to do? And we shared a little bit about that. Well, today I want to talk about surprise. Surprise is a great word, isn't it? Now, let me ask you this. Let me ask you a question. How many of you love surprises? Now, be honest. How many? Raise your hand. You love surprises? How many of you? Now, how many of you? That's not a lot, by the way. How many of you do not like surprises? How many of you? Not, all right. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. The most of us. And why don't we like surprises? We don't like surprises because, you know what? We can't control surprises, can we? We like to be in control. And surprises means we're not in control. The mere essence of a surprise means you don't know it's coming, right? We don't like surprises because we, we can't control them. Now, I try, to I try to control a surprise. This is a true story. People don't believe this. Is I got pictures to prove it, if you, if you don't. Uh, um, um, so I, in my early 20s, I had just graduated college, and I, and I was living in my own apartment, in my own little townhouse in, in Miami Shores, and I decided to throw myself a surprise birthday party because no one was going to do it. So true story. I really did. I really did. And what I did, now, this was back in the day that nobody had a cell phone, so what happens is I would call all my friends and leave a message in this little thing called an answering machine. Y'all remember an answering machine? Uh, so um, and a little answering machine. And so if they answered, I wouldn't leave a message. But, it, but if the answering machine answered, true story, I would say, hi, this is Ruben. I'm throwing myself a surprise birthday party. Don't tell me if you're coming. But if you do come, this is the time and place. True story. To, I, you know, my work friends, my church friends, I had my college friends. So I invited everybody. So it's, it's, so it's the day of the party. It's about like, you know, I don't know, 8, 9, 9 o'clock. There's nobody there. And I'm thinking, that. Ah, ultimately, they surprised me. But eventually, people showed up. We had a great time. I was trying to control my own surprise party. And so I actually was surprised because I didn't know who was coming. Thankfully, people came, and I was surprised. But you don't really get to control surprises, can you? They, they, they come out of nowhere. Well, the entry of Jesus into the world was a big surprise, a big surprise. They were not prepared. They had no idea what God was doing in this, in this baby. Believe me, nobody, all the people that were expecting the birth of the Messiah, that were expecting the Messiah to come, had no idea that he was going to come as, to a poor family as a little baby in a poor part of town. They were surprised. And many in our culture don't really know what Christmas is about. Really, people don't, even today. Unfortunately, uh, the focus of Christmas is anything but Jesus. I'll prove it to you. I'll prove it to you. Let me ask you this. What are the top ten? Anybody here know what are any of the top ten 
uh, all-time gro uh, grossing movies of all Christmas movies of all time. And by the way, uh, Die Hard is not one, nor is A Christmas Story. Everybody think Die Hard is actually called a Christmas movie because it came out during. It, it's not in the top ten, nor is A Christmas Story, which is one of my personal favorites. Does anybody know? Now, of course, Die Hard, uh, uh, Home Alone is actually number two. Anybody? Which ones? Which ones? Christmas Vacation. Nope. Nope. It's a wonderful life. No. Now it's grossing, so it probably because it's on TV, it maybe didn't make that much money. Top ten movies. Top ten movies. Love Actually, yes, that's number seven. I can't believe that's a Christmas movie. Gremlins is not. Here you go. Here's the list. Ten. The Santa Claus makes sense. Makes sense. Nine. The Holiday. Never saw it. Didn't even know. Didn't even know. Gr top ten grossing movies. Uh, Elf. It's kind of funny. I've seen that one. Elf is good. Uh, seven. Love Actually. Six. The Polar Express. Of course, right? of course, we've seen that one. A Christmas Carol, number five, top ten grossing all time. Number four, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Yep. Number two, Home Alone two. Number, no, I mean, number three, Home Alone two. Number two, Home Alone. It's confusing. Number one, all time grossing movie of all Christmas movie of all time, The Grinch, with Jim Carrey. What's missing? Jesus. Top. 10 in our culture Christmas grossing movies of all time not a mention of Jesus not even a not even a glimpse if you miss Christ and what Christ did for you then you miss the surprise of what Jesus can do for you Christmas is all about Christ it's in the name Christ mass but our culture, and again, I, you know, I'm not one of those preachers that talks bad about our culture. I love our culture. But little by little, folks, it's getting pushed away from what Christmas is about. And so it is our job, the church, and we as individuals, to make sure that we keep Christ in Christmas. TV shows, look at, it, look at, it, look at the media, everything. When they talk about Christmas, it's, there's all kinds of stuff. That, that's going on. The good news of Jesus' incarnation and God coming to us, again, was a surprising interruption into our expectations of who God is and who we're called to be. So I'm going to read to you uh, from Mark 1, 1 through 18. Again, we don't have few Bibles. I've been given uh, a, a couple thousand dollars by uh, church members uh, uh, as a gift to buy Bibles. So we've already ordered some. We're going to start having them in the pews. And what we want you to do is we want you to take those Bibles home, especially if you don't have one. I want you to, when you read the Bibles, write notes on it. Somebody said to me, Pastor Ruben, I never realized, I, I never thought that you should write notes on the Bible because the Bible is so sacred. Uh, um, and I understand that and I respect that, but we, we want to share with you that it's okay. It is okay to write on your Bible, keep it, um, um, you know, um, because it's about learning more about what the Bible says. But I'll, I'll read to you from that. In Mark's gospel, the words, it starts with, in the beginning. And that's a reminder of Genesis 1. Because Mark is saying, listen, this is a new beginning, a new start. Something, God is doing something fresh, something new. So let me read to you. Uh, uh, you know, now, Mark made a lot of Old Testament references in his gospel. He tied. Mark, especially, he tied much of what was going on in the life of Jesus with the Hebrew scriptures. It's all over Mark. Many scholars believe that Mark wrote his gospel for the Jewish audience. They would tie in a lot of it. So he starts with this in, 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 in the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah. Again, Mark 1, verse 1. So he's tying it to in the beginning. Everybody knew in the beginning from Genesis 1. Now Mark is saying there's a new beginning. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written, he says, in Isaiah, the prophet. By the way, this is Isaiah 40, verse 3. I'm going to read to you Isaiah 40. That's what it is. But he says, as it is written in Isaiah, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. So in essence, look at what Mark is doing. Mark is saying that this is a new advent. It's a new beginning, a new start. How many of us can use a new start in our life? A new beginning. That's what Mark is saying, that, that the birth of Jesus is a new beginning 
for the people of faith. He, he pointed to Isaiah, but you know, you can also read in Malachi 3.1. Malachi 3.1 says this in the Old Testament. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to this temple, to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Almighty God. So in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, they've been waiting for this, for this, uh, first of all, they're waiting for a messenger to come before the Messiah comes. That's been part of it. By the way, our Jewish brothers and sisters are still waiting today. You know that, right? They're still waiting today, right? And, and we respect them. We disagree because we believe that's Jesus. But here's the example. So, so uh, Mark is pointing, reminding his audience about the Old Testament scriptures. Now he goes on in verse 4. Mark 1, 4 through 5. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sin. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. So get this. Get this. John the Baptist John the Baptist is the bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. John the Baptist is the bridge between the Hebrew Scriptures and the Christian Scriptures. He is the one that Isaiah 43 was speaking about, one coming out in the wilderness. Uh, uh, he is the one that Malachi 3.1 was speaking about. And, and, and he, he, he said this, the first advent is announced in the wilderness. Not in a temple, not in a, a church, but in the wilderness. Where, where people uh, are gathered. Mark's gospel has none of Matthew or Luke's narrative of the virgin birth. Mark has no mention of the virgin birth because Mark starts with John the Baptist. No wise men or shepherds. In a sense, John the Baptist's sermon is Mark's equivalent to Luke's nativity. Here is the beginning of the Christian faith, of a new way of living, the birth of a, a new way of, of being with God. God with us, Emmanuel. Something so fresh that the people were not prepared. And so it surprised them. A new start. And, and John yells, yells in the wilderness. He says, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight his path. But how do you prepare? And prepare for what? The way of Jesus which includes a lifestyle of surprises and change. You see, nobody needs to be told this morning. None of you need to be told this morning. Prepare to be bored to death by another dull sermon that says what you want to say or what you want to hear. No preparation is needed for walking in the direction you've always walked. There's no preparation needed this morning if you're going to continue to do the things you've always done. You don't need to prepare if you're going to do the same old, same old. John the Baptist appears in the middle of nowhere and says to the gathered masses, he says, prepare because God is bringing and doing something new in the life of the believer. And I'm going to challenge you, church. I, I venture to say that even in our lives today, even in our lives today, we need to prepare if we want God to do something new in our life. If we're tired of doing the same old religion, if we're tired of doing the same old Christmas, if we really want God to do something new in our life, we need to get ready. John's sermon is basically, here comes Jesus, get ready to change the way you live. Be surprised and, ha and, and have your world turn upside down. And for that, you need to be prepared. Something new, shocking. It's like being in a plane. You ever been in a plane and you're in an airplane, the pilot gets, uh, get, you know, gets on the loudspeaker and, and you're sitting there relaxed, you're calm, everything's great. And he says, welcome aboard, flight to, to the show, folks. Uh, settle in, make yourselves comfortable to an uneventful flight to New York. We love that, don't we? Comfortable, relax. I want to hear that at every flight. A relaxed pilot. I always, look at the, I always look at the stewardesses. If they look nervous, I'm nervous. But they're trained to not look nervous. You know that? They're trained to look calm because we look at them. But what John did, in essence, is like the pilot saying, everybody check your seat belts. We're in for a rough ride. Get ready. It's going to be rough. 
It's going to be different. Jesus' birth into the world is not just about another baby or another religion or another way of life. Jesus comes into our world to rock our world in a surprising way. And if you want to receive what Christ really is about this year, you got to prepare. Prepare the way of the Lord, he says. John the Baptist announces not just a change of heart, but the advent of a new world, a new way of living. Let me ask you this. Have you ever been caught unprepared for something? Have you ever been caught unprepared? Maybe for a test or for a guest or for an event. If we're not careful, we can be caught unprepared for Jesus in our life. Someone's once said about Advent, God has never shown up to me. I'm not really surprised by God during Advent. So is it not reasonable to say, well, maybe God has, but you weren't prepared to be surprised. You weren't ready. A few years ago, I was part of a church, and we started to pray this prayer. We started to say, God, send us people that nobody wants. And we would pray as a church, God, send us people that nobody wants. We thought we were so cool. We thought we were just this great church. And you know what happened? You know what happened? God began to send people that nobody else wanted to our church. And we weren't ready for it. We weren't ready for it. It changed the makeup of the church. It upset the community. And we weren't ready. Uh, I want to warn you this morning, be, be, be careful what you pray for. Be careful what you pray for. Sometimes we pray for things that we're not ready to receive. Amen? Some of us that are single are praying to be in relationships, but we're not ready. So many, so many of us, myself included, got into relationships when we weren't ready and, 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 and our lives got changed. Sometimes we want to be out of our homes. We're not ready. Sometimes we want certain things and we're just not ready. We've got to prepare our hearts first. John is reminding us that if you want God to enter your life, if you want a new and different kind of life, you need to prepare the way of the Lord. And let me tell you something else about preparation that's very important for you to understand, for us to remember. Whenever you're preparing for anything, in your life. Do the little things you need to do now to accomplish the great things later. Do the little things you need to do now to accomplish the great things later. A lot of us want great things, but we're not willing to do the little things. Work on the little things in your life. Want to change your life? Want to change uh, certain things about your life? Work on those little things, and great things will come in the name of Christ. Now, one way to prepare, uh, the Bible tells us, Right? John says, the way to prepare for God. You know, you, and now, I'm going to assume all of you have done this. Maybe not. It starts, with, it starts with getting baptized and repenting. It starts with getting baptized and repenting. Because baptism, you're saying that you know, you're asking God to wash away your sins. Whether you did it as a baby, whether you did it as an adult, you're asking God to enter into your life and wash away your sins. Now, John preaches baptism even before he speaks of repentance. Because repentance, get this, repentance is not something that you do but rather something God does in you. See, I used to think repentance was me feeling sorry. Oftentimes, I just feel sorry I got caught. Amen? You all know. You know the truth. Got sorry I got caught. No, real repentance is something that God does in your heart. When you do something different, when you do something wrong, and then you begin to realize that it hurt people, you begin to realize that it goes against God, and inside of you, inside of you, God changes your heart. So you feel repentance. Because you remember that the price of what you did was already paid. And you repent. And by the, way, by the way, repentance is an ongoing process in the life of a Christian. We're constantly in repentance because we're constantly living in life. So, so the right, through the rite of baptism, takes all, even though it takes only a few minutes to be baptized, but it takes a lifetime to finish what God has begun in you. So as you prepare, we start by repenting. 
and, and getting baptized, accepting, which means we accept what God did for us. Have you accepted the fact that God sent his son to die for your mistakes, for your sins, and that you're loved and accepted by God? Some of us haven't, which is why we miss Christmas, which is why we miss really what that baby is about. Mark 1, 6 through 8. John, the author says, and, you, and the first time I read this I, for years, I, n- I never understood why. Because he didn't do this about anybody else except for John almost. He says, John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. And he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So first of all, why does Mark describe John the Baptist that way? Clothing made of camel's hair, leather belt, eating locusts and wild honey. Kind of sounds crazy, kind of a crazy guy, right? That image, though, most Old Testament scholars, most people, the early audience, the Jewish uh, scriptures automatically knew who he was saying. They automatically knew that he was pointing to Elijah the prophet because it is Elijah the prophet that is believed in, in Malachi Uh, It it was foretold that, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord's come. So in the in the Jewish faith and actually when they do a Passover meal, often they have one cup of they have five cups of wine. There's one cup that nobody drinks. You know why? They're waiting for Elijah the prophet. And that's part of their tradition in a Passover meal. There's I mean, in a a Jewish Passover meal, there's four cups of wine, the the, uh, five cups of wine. The fifth one is not nobody drinks it because they're still waiting for this Elijah. But. Mark, the author who wrote Mark, said, listen, Elijah came in John the Baptist. John is the Jesus opening act, the one who warms up the audience right before the attraction. And then what does John say? He's getting a big following. He's preaching. He's baptizing people. They're coming from all over. They're asking him, are you the Messiah? Are you the one we've been waiting for, John? And he says, no. What does he say? There's one who's coming after me. One who is more powerful. Right here in this translation, it says, mightier than I. John the Baptist says, after me comes one more powerful. And he's describing Jesus. Jesus is more powerful than John. And the people are waiting for this powerful Messiah. So, Mark preaches grace rather than judgment. Um, real quick, the God, you know, um, we have four Gospels, right? Four Gospels talk about the life of Jesus. They, I want you to think about the Gospels as four different people telling the same story. Just they, they, they saw the story in different ways. That's why you have differences sometimes in the Gospels. It's not that they're lying. It's not that they're not telling the truth. Each one is telling the truth. But if, but, but if I take four of you right now, just four random people, and, and, and an event happens, and I ask you to describe the event, each of you will tell it a different way because each of you see it a different way. That's all the Gospels are. So in, in, in this story in Matthew 3, he says, I baptize you with the water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His willowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn, and burning, burning the shaft with the unquenched fire. So in, in, uh, in Matthew and Luke, because Luke says the same thing, their emphasis on this story is about God killing off, getting rid of all the non-believers. Judgment. Mark's version is emphasizing grace. Now, we live in a time where there's so much judgment. There's so much judgment. And yes, yes, uh, um, at certain cases, I guess we need to do that. But, but I want to emphasize God's grace. That we need to remember in our faith that God so loved the world. Not just Methodists. Not just Americans, not just men, not just women, 
For God so loved the world that he gave his son. That's grace. But it's so amazing about John's testimony about Jesus being more powerful. And this is amazing to me because after John makes this statement and he meets Jesus and he baptizes Jesus and he says, you know, this man is greater than I am, more powerful. Then a little while later, John gets arrested and he's sitting in jail. What do you think he's thinking? Well, Jesus has to free me. I got to get out of there. You know, I, he won't leave me here. He's powerful. He's going to get an army. He's going to do incredible things. Because you see, even John the Baptist did not understand Jesus' purpose. And so he began to doubt. You ever doubt? It's great to know I'm not the only one. Listen to this. Matthew 11, 2 to 6. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah... He sent his disciples and he asked them, listen to this, are you, tell him, are you the one who's to come or should we expect someone else? Do you see? John is doubting. Even after seeing the powerful things that Jesus does, John begins to doubt because John missed the true power of Christ. Jesus then replies, says, go back and report to John what you hear and see, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to everybody. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. You see, John, John the Baptist, the messenger that came before the Christ, missed it. He was looking for a powerful, uh, uh, of might, Savior. Jesus came as a miracle. Even John the Baptist was surprised. Have you ever shared John's surprise? Thinking something about Jesus being powerful. And Jesus shows it in, in a different way. You know, last week I reminded you that God far exceeds our expectations. Everybody misses what this baby is truly about. And what Christmas is truly about. And it surprises some people. Um, I was 23, 24 years old. Just finished breaking up a relationship where that I was about to get married. I was in the dumps. I didn't know any direction in my life. I had no will to keep going. It was, it was a dark time in my life. And I went on a mission trip. To, to a country and, and working in the mission trip and in the middle of the field, I remember just feeling this incredible love of God and understanding that God truly loved me, even me. And I remember sitting there with tears because for the first time in my life, Jesus was born in my heart. For the first time in my life, Jesus was real. And because of that experience in that field, I've dedicated my life to Christ. Jesus did not come to preach the gospel, the good news. He was the good news. Bishop Will Willimon says this, prepare for the advent of Christ by locating yourself as close as you can to where Christ is likely to show up. Christmas is here. Do you miss it? There's a story he tells about a little boy named Michael. Michael's teacher comes up and, and announces to the class, to the sixth, to, he says here, to our sixth grade class, this is Michael. And a frightened little blonde boy stood up before us. She says, he's from Poland. Class, can you help him learn English? He is a displaced person. What's that? Michael has had to leave his homeland and come to America because of the war. He's been displaced. Michael, take your seat. The author says, we tried to do what we could to relate to this displaced person. He rapidly got the hang of English and, and schoolyard softball. But there was one problem. He stole food. A, 
a Twinkie would disappear from someone's lunchbox. Somebody's sandwich went missing. One day, the displaced person was caught in the act. Responding to our complaints, the teacher opened Michael's desk. Old, stale sandwiches, apples, and fig newtons were packed in the back. Michael, you must not take other people's food. Do you understand me? The teacher said. Michael nodded. But just as we predicted, ne the next day, there was Janie in tears because her slice of chocolate pie that her grandmother had given her was gone. Michael, said our teacher as she shook the displaced person. Stop stealing food. She said, you're not in Poland anymore. You're in America. America, there's enough food here for everybody. I promise you that you'll never go hungry ever again. You need food? All you have to do is ask. Do you hear me? You're not in Poland anymore. And I tell you, Michael's eyes grew wide. He silently nodded as if he finally understood he never again took anybody's food. He was different. This place no more. His eyes had been opened and he had become a, a citizen of a new country. Get this, Michael had awakened to a whole new world, a new way of living. How many of you are still living the old way? Not understanding that this is a new life in Christ. Uh, I think it was uh, yesterday or Friday. I was at Publix. My wife and I were at Publix. We're, we're shopping. And, and, and my wife says, nods at me. She goes, that lady's stealing. And I turn around and I see a lady putting stuff in her purse. I didn't want to assume. Maybe she's going to pay for it. And, and, and I didn't know. I didn't know. I kind of froze. And as I watched her, and, and I remembered other times where I've seen people steal. And I began to wonder, why is she stealing? And I think it's she's stealing. Now, you, some may say, well, she's, cause she's lazy and she doesn't want to work or she's mental. I, I don't know. But... I began to think, how many people live today stealing and robbing and hurting and cheating others? Because that's the only way they know. Because that's how they were raised. Because that's what they were taught. And that's the only way they know. I'm not saying it's right. But I believe that lady does not understand what Jesus is about. We live in a time where people are so disrespectful to each other, where nobody trusts anybody anymore. A culture that if given the opportunity, you'll take from others if nobody can catch you. Not understanding that Jesus came to give us a new way of living, that we don't have to live that way anymore. If she only knew what God can do for her, she would never steal again. If Reuben only really knew what God can do for me, I would never doubt. I would never have anxiety. I would never struggle anymore. Let that new way of life surprise you in amazing ways this Christmas, my friends. John the Baptist preached the surprisingly good news that we need not to climb up to God. That in Jesus Christ, God comes down to us taking the time for us, staying with us, even though we don't know how to, how to stay with God. God is ready to surprise you. You know, Christmas is, uh, actual Christmas day is in, in what, 14 days, 15 days, I don't know. Are you ready to be surprised? Are you prepared to truly receive what God wants to give you? I know I'm not always prepared. I know I struggle. So I pray we're ready. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for your incredible love. Father, help us. Help us to truly be ready to receive what you have for us. Forgive us when we doubt. Forgive us when we steal and cheat and hurt others. And treat people in a horrible way. Forgive us. Because those are the times that we forget what you did for us. 
that if we lived in a way, in a way that Christmas was alive in us each and every day, it would be a whole new way of living. Lord, and I especially pray for that lady. I don't know her heart. And to be honest, I don't even know if she stole anything that day. But I have a feeling if she did, that she does not know what you did for her. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Let us uh, turn and let us stand and sing our closing number. It's, it's the beautiful, uh, it came upon the midnight clear. And it's all verses. face shine upon you and now go and be ready for what God can do in your life God is this amazing amazing God that wants to love you all you got to do is be prepared and open your hearts God bless you and go in peace amen and amen